Thank you for subscribing to our channel on YouTube. If you don't already subscribe, please do. We've just reached our thousand subs subscriber mark and very excited about that. Um, you can always turn notifications on or off if you want to be notified on your phone, ding, 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 every time we send out a video. You can, but you can turn that off and just when you go into YouTube, look and see what new videos we have. What I wanted to talk to you about today is my trip to Germany, which was really exciting. That was um, been two weeks now since I've been. Uh, we had the, uh, Jean and I had the opportunity to go and work in the Jaguar uh, factory for training. Now this isn't something um, you could just ordinarily ask to do. Uh, way, this was a series of several months, almost a year, in having this arranged. Uh, the large the distributor that brings Jaguar shears over the United States wanted to have us certified as sharpeners because um, we're their liaison between Jaguar and sharpeners in the USA. And so our trip to Germany was um, very exciting. I was able to work inside the Jaguar factory. Now Jaguar is the largest supplier of professional beauty shears in all the world. Um, I know they're not huge in the United States and they may be eventually, but in other countries, especially in Europe and even in um, Japan and um, countries all around the world, South America uh, areas, uh, Jaguar is very, very large. and. We were able to take a tour of the factory and was just amazed at the number of shears that they produce on a daily uh, basis and the number of workers they have there and the steps that they went through. But that, uh, there's several videos, if you'll look, I'll put some links in below that you can watch on the Jaguar um, manufacturing. They would not let us take pictures inside there um, while we were going through the tour and also while I was training other than, a, I'll, I got a couple of little ones in, I'll show you. but. Um, when I finished, I was very proud. I got the certificate um, that we're authorized um, sharpeners. And as far as I know, I think it's only us and one other company that's authorized to sharpen Jaguars. Um, those of you that are sharpeners and you need to sharpen Jaguars, if you want, I, I can't authorize you, but if you want to call me or we work out something where you send shears to me for sharpening or something, um, we, we can talk about that. But what I wanted to share with you was some of the things I learned in the factory and um, brought back and I'm kind of playing around with it. Uh, one of them is that they really, and you'll see my machine is upright, that's how I had to use it there. Um, they trained me first of all on the Wolf machine, the Okami, the twice as sharp as some of us know as the Taz machine. And the, the lower end shears, their pre-style and their white line. Um, we sharpened those. In fact, it was a better part of two days I was working only on that machine. And I now feel proficient on it. I'd never really used it before. And I'm not sure if the way they taught me is the way I would learn if I was in Spartanburg. Um, but I'm proficient in the way they wanted me to sharpen. And the, those shears were done on that machine. And then afterwards I said, well, wait, 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 wait. I'm not going to be using that machine. I'm going to be using the Cymac. And so then um, I was able to replicate what they had me doing on the twice, twice as sharp on the Cymec and they were happy with my results. So I'm not saying you have to have that to do the low end shears, but I am saying that the, uh, the pre-style and the white line um, can very well be sharpened on um, the Okami as they can on a flat hump. With that being said, when we went to the higher end shears, um, the silver and the gold, and they, they gave me some Tondeo, even though I'm not certified in it, some other things, um, we definitely had to go to the flat home. Now, when we took the tour of their factory, and they only allowed me in this room, the guys that were with us on the tour, and I'll, I'll talk about their, the guys that were able to come and join us from other countries in a minute, but um, it was a, a large wheel. It's a flat hone, and they had more than one. And um, the, the polishing was extremely important to them. Now, that hasn't always been one of my higher priorities. And um, I always felt like if the shear cut good, it, you know, it, it's a little scratchy, a little hazy. It's, it's not a big deal. For them, it was. So we worked a lot on the polishing. 
Now typically when I polish, I'm using a felt pad. Let's see if I have one over here. Oh, here's a really nice worn felt pad like I would be using. And mine looked a little fresher than this when I brought it, but um, I use um, uh, the white polish. Let me find it here. Which is, um, usually it's aluminum oxide. This is the white polish we have that's similar to the Okami Gold polish that Wolf has. Um, the white compound uh, will remove most of the scratches, give a decent shine. It's not as good as the green polish, which is the chromium oxide that they used. And so what they had me do is my felt pad, as you see it's green, um, we were using their polish on my felt pad. And I have to admit, I did get a better shine using their chromium oxide, their green polish. Now, I, since I came back, I bought some of the green polish. And I'm finding it's not the same quality as what we were using in Germany. Now, I wasn't able to buy any of that polish from them. They're, and it's understandable. I mean, it's the largest factory in the world, and the way they got that way is having um, uh, industrial um, privilege and secrets and um, higher quality than what we can get as sharpeners. But um, what I noticed on their polish, it was it, it made a mess, but it wasn't as soft as uh, maybe it didn't have as much wax in it as the chromium oxide I purchased. And, the, and this is the other thing that worried me when I got it. Um, on the box, it says, Warning, Cancer and Reproductive Harm. Um, well, I'm a little bit beyond worrying about reproductive harm, but cancer does worry me. Um, so I, it worries me a little bit about breathing it, and also because they had me polishing with an upright um, it, and I was freehanding the polishing, and I, this, I was breathing it in. Of course, I was standing up, so it wasn't right in my nose like you see in this video. But if I was at the office polishing, I would probably sit down. And um, the, the green polish actually does a better job, but it's a little messier. And uh, when I do the Jaguar shears, yes, I'll use the, the better polish to get the better shine because um, I want to sharpen the way they want me to sharpen. But in general, um, I'm going to stay with the white polish. Um, the white polish is a little bit more aggressive. Even though it's not as shiny, it's a little bit more aggressive and it takes out more of the scratches I've left behind. But it doesn't get me to that extra luster. I mean, I think what you would, you know, I, in the ideal world, you might do this and then go might go with a white and then go with a green afterwards. Well, but we're in business. Also, when I polish, I usually use the one micron spray. Um, the green, the green chromium um, oxide that they're using is probably closer to a half a micron um, as far as the polish and the shine. And as I said, it really did have a nice shine. Now, one of the other things, when you're thinking about polishing, you're thinking about how shiny is that blade? How nice is it? What I found was really surprising. It was a big, big deal about sharpening, about um, smoothing and polishing the tips on the shears. Now, understand most of the shears I was training on, well, all the shears I was training on were shears that um, were new. They were ones, I think they were just two pieces and we put them together, you know, and I sharpened and put them together. So they, they didn't always, the tips didn't always line up perfectly. When I'm sharpening shears, someone's given me some shears that, you know, stylists has been using. Uh, it's rare I find, although it does happen sometimes, it's rare I find one blade is taller than the other. And usually that's because, um, uh, probably a manufacturer's defect. Let me grab a pair of shears here. Let's see what I've got up here. Mm, no, I don't want a curved shear. Ah, oh, another curved shear. Let's see. What do I have here? Oh, there we go. That's one of these little shimmers. That's the ones that we use for training. It's a soft metal, but it's um, it, it's it's the quality is good enough that we can tell whether that's you know it's the sharpener making a mistake or not. 
So, the way they would have me do this tip is I would start out on, and we did this on the Okami and also on my flat home, so it both worked out. We would start out with, um, he, they liked me to use the 600 grit, which I rarely ever use. Um, I, I like the 800 grit. Those of you that know me know that's my favorite. But they would have me up with a 600 grit. I put just put an 800 on it. And I'm coming in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slide this off so you can see what they had me do. Struggle, struggle. Slide this off. Uh, I'll do it from this angle and from this angle so you can see both ways. And I apologize for my messy... Um, Sharpening training area. I clean up before people come for training. Um, I'm I'm not as neat as Misty, and I'm not as sloppy as Jean. So I'm somewhere in between. Makes makes me the same one here, I guess. So I'm working on. I'm gonna draw a picture of this tip if I can. like the tip on a share. So I'm working on, and, and, and this is kind of a 3D thing here. So I'm working on, first of all, that part and this part. And then I'll be working on those corners. And then I'm going to be working on the rounding it off. Does that make sense? So I would come in with a machine going, one, two, three. I'll put it in this angle so you can see what I'm doing. And it's not all the way up, it's not all the way down, it's going after that little corner right there. One, two, three. Had to be three times. Then one, two, three. And then the next one, I'm going after this corner here, that part right there. And it's one, two, flip it over, one, two, and this next one was the really tricky one. I'll, I'm going to do it on this side and this side of the plate. It was lighter, and it was still coming kind of on this corner, but I'm rotating it to the left. Had to be to the left, here, and then rotating it to the left, and that was just one time. So I'm going to do this here so you can see it. I'm here and then rotating it to the left. And here, rotating it to the left. And I assume what that's doing is getting this more of a rounded shape. And then after I did that on the 600 grid, then I switched out to my polishing. And this is what my polishing pad looks like since I left Germany. I worked this poor little felt so hard it one time when I was sharpening, it went, it just, first time ever, it just cut loose and went flying across the room. Of course, it was just light felt, so no one got hurt. And um, Pedro, who was my teacher, he was awesome, by the way. Pedro um, uh, went through and had some of this double sticky carpet tape. And I've used that before to stick felt things down and things on the machine, so I, I was very familiar with it. And he used that to stick it down and it, it, it didn't fly anywhere after that. But once again, I would go to this, and I wouldn't do that beginning one, one, two, three. I just skip that step, and I would do the one, two, one, two. And I'll do it this way so you can kind of see it from this direction. One, two, one, two. But just two times, not, not four. And then the last one was kind of this and turn, and I, I'll do it so you can see it from here, this and turn, and then I flipped it over, and this and turn, and this and turn to the left. Well, yeah, if you're turning to the left going this way, you're going away from the wheel. If you're going um, this way, you're going into the center. But I think it was the direction of the turn more than what direction you were going with the wheel. Um, 
I would turn it the, uh, the other way and he would say no. But because I, I, some of the things, because of language, I didn't always know why. I just knew to do it like they were telling me to do without question. So the polishing, like I said, was a big deal after I sharpened it when I did the silver and the gold line, the higher ends, the, the, what we call the convex edge, they call the integrated edge. Same thing. Um, I was doing those by hand to do the polish, although the initial angle and the getting that convex shape was done with the clamping system so that I could get it well, no, I'll take that back. The initial angle, which was um, in those cases, was always 45. I would do with the clamping system. And then with freehanding, I would round it to get that convex shape, but always the clamp to get the precise angle. And the other thing on that, they weren't, you know, um, Pedro was training me, but there was also a guy over him that didn't speak English, and he was... Um, very adamant that as much as you can don't pull the shear out he said that changes the angle to try to when I set the clamp and I put the angle in there keep it exact keep it exactly the same and try to have the whole thing on the plate and I think that's why they had such large plates now their largest shear is seven inch and I'm not sure if, it, if they have a seven inch in the integrated edge um, lines um, don't know for sure, so, but up to, you know, six inches, I didn't have any problem with getting the whole thing on my plate without pulling it out. Now, I might have to angle it um, either this way or that way. I'll show you this, this way or that way to angle it to get the whole thing on there. But um, I was able to create that burr, that initial burr, without pulling it out. Um, so that was something he had me be very careful of. And then also, then when I went to the um, creating that convex shape and in the polishing, they had me um, n n do that not in the same place on my plate to kind of change where it was. And I noticed that did make a difference in removing the scratches and making it uh, more shiny. Now, the other thing that was different than way, the way I sharpen, uh, most of it was, you know, you create a burr, remove a burr, you know, adjust the screws. I mean, you know, your, your basics in sharpening. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things I thought was interesting is how they tested the shears. Now, on the lower end ones, on the pre-style and the um, white line, we tested it on, it looked like um, it's a type of fabric. And I asked them about it. It took me a couple of people to ask to find out what it was, but it was almost like a gauze, like what you would wrap your arm in when you're um, with a wound or something. And um, they said that, because that, I asked for some of that to bring back for testing, and I was told that if I just bought some um, like medical gauze, that would be the same. And it would tell you if the tip pulled. Um, then if we were sharpening thinning shears, we would test it on hair, and they had hair wrapped, um, big old chunks of hair in a little tray wrapped with a rubber band, and we would cut it and pull out, just basically the way I, I test thinning shears now. Um, but I thought the gauze stuff was, I'd never seen that used before. Uh, then when we were doing the higher end shears, um, what was really interesting on the integrated or the convex edge shears, they were using, and I'm going to show you because I have some, Don't laugh. I, I find wonders, interesting things at garage sales, and I had already bought this. Um, big giant box of this film wrap. Um, I use this when we're shipping Cymex out. I like to wrap them up with this, and so that's why I found this. But they would cut this cellophane. We call it cellophane. This is called film wrap. Um, I was um, Googling about it, and I think every country has a different name for it, but this, this is what they tested the shears on. And if the shears didn't cut, it would pull. And usually if it was pulling on both the low end and the high end, then we would take it over to another station. 
and there was a gentleman there that had a hammer, and he would tap it with his hammer. Um, I bought a hammer. It's not exactly like the one he had, um, but I bought this hammer the other day because not that I think I'm going to really tap tap the scissors, um, but he had a brass that he used for the ones that had a color finish on it, and then he had a, a hard, I guess it was steel, and it was a bigger hammer than this. It, it wasn't this hammer, and he had a separate one for the brass one, and I was told that the hammer and the anvil were a harder steel than the shears, and if it was the low-end shears, and this fascinated me. If it was a low-end shears and he was checking the alignment, he had the, you know, alignment bar with the light behind it, you know, it was set up there on the station. He didn't take them apart. He pressed right down here where it's flat and pressed on there and would check and that, if, see if that tip was up or, or, you know, if the curve was off and then he would tap it on the anvil either this way or that way depending on what it needed. Um, they didn't let me do any hammering, but they showed me how. And I was told later, I probably, in my repairs, it would be safer and I would be better off just using the slot and bending. And in our tour of the factory, we did see one station where the lady had like, it was a, a large acrylic block type of thing, and she was doing some bending. So we saw hammering and bending. The actual putting the curvature into the shears and the manufacturing was a multi-step process from the, uh, the initial forging, hot drop forge, to the, the way the um, hollow is ground in, you know, with that, that twist type of thing to it, to um, actual hammering. They, from what I understood, they hammered all the shears, and, um, and then after they were finished, if they weren't quite right, then there was some more hammering. Now, on, um, back to the tips. After we did all this polishing on it, then Pedro, who was bald, would take up here and rub at his head. And, uh, I, you know, my, my, what I normally do when I'm sharpening, I'll kind of rub it on my wrist and I'll check it. And if not, I'll go in and polish it. But he had me, every one of them, and he'd rub it on his head. And one of the guys that was with us at the end of uh, my training, that came from the UK. He was also a barber and he was telling me, he says, yeah, that's really, really important. He said, because if you're going through somebody's hair with the shears, and I'm not going to open these so you're going to see a really interesting video with me cutting my hair, but you go through the hair with the shears um, and it, if it scratches the head, you've got a problem. And so I get, I, one of the things I took back from my trip to Germany is how important it is for that tip not to have any scratchiness. I knew it was important, but I didn't know um, the emphasis probably I need to put on it. And uh, I'll be incorporating that more into my training from now on. That's one of the things I'll change. Um, one of the other things, uh, back to the polishing. I, I used my felt plate because that was all I had. They had something look like a vegan or synthetic leather. They just kind of showed it to me. I didn't get to use it. Um, I kind of looked at it. They told me that I would be better off with leather than felt. So since I came back, I bought different kinds of leather and I've been experimenting with them. And um, I stuck them down to my uh, one of my abrasive sheets so that I could put it on and off as a, as a um, you know, pull it off so it's not stuck down permanently like this is supposed to be, and it's not necessarily. Um, and I got a smooth leather, and I was using the chrome oxide, and I didn't didn't like the results. Maybe I'm just not as knowledgeable about using this. I got a rougher leather, and I wasn't too crazy about it. Um, I, I did some experimental polishing, and I did, wasn't happy with it. But I did get um, like a suede. And this was a black suede, and I just I haven't used any of the white on it. I only used the the green chromium oxide, the green rouge, and I did like the way this performed. Now I don't know if I like it better than the felt or not. Uh, I might do some further experimenting. We may offer this um, 
if I keep working with this, because I may go ahead and try it with my, I only ordered the one, I might try it with my diamond and with my white polishing compound and see how it works. Or, but I'll probably keep this for when I do the Jaguar, since they do want me to use the chromium oxide, the green rouge, to make it extra shiny. Um, and maybe um, on times when I've got a brand new shear that's in that um, may be input on the shelf, it got a little nick in it or something, I've got, I need to polish it up and get it uh, as new. Um, some of our sample shears, that kind of thing, I may pull this out. But I think for my general sharpening, I'm going to stay with what I have. Um, as I said, I'll, I'm going to do some more experimenting and we'll see where we go on that. Um, what else did I learn in Germany? I think those were the main things. Oh, we did use the little hammer a lot for, um, <laughs> and this is what I think I, I spent half my time on, is those lower, uh, I keep calling the lower end shears. All their shears are really, really good steel. Really attention to detail, really high quality. I was impressed with it. So, I, mean, I, I mean, even the ones that we sell for like $52, $54. I mean, the workmanship that goes into it, um, I, I can't imagine. But on those, they had these little plastic, um, he had a long German name like this, he called them, but um, they're this, actually this little plastic um, nut that goes in the back of the shear. I'll see if I can find one here. Um, I've got the parts. I'll, I'll put the picture of the part in here. And I would have to use a little plastic hammer to hammer that in good and then I would have to screw the screw straight into it. And they've gone back to normal screws, not the crazy screws that we had for a while, but the normal screws had a much wider slot than what my screwdrivers normally have. So I was having to use their screwdriver, which was huge. So one of the other things I'm gonna purchase now that I got back is, um, I like the, the Wolf Scissor Pliers. Um, let me show you those. I know most of you have seen these wolf scissor pliers, and the two standard size um, bits, screwdriver bits that come in here, are really too small for using on the Jaguar. So I'm going to be looking and finding some larger, wider bits to go on my scissor pliers, and I think that will solve. As I said, I had to struggle and struggle and struggle because the screw kept going and crooked and they want me to replace the screw, the washer, all those parts every time I do service work on the Jaguar shears. Um, don't ask me about getting parts. That's, that's, uh, let's take this one step at a time. But anyway, I'm thinking this will work on, on adjusting those screws. That is a real difficulty for me because I have very weak hands and I'm um, trying to get some of the grip on things. Um, some of you guys, it may not be any problem with it at all. We did a lot of bending handles. Um, they used the hammer and they would bang, bang, bang the, ha um, the handle. And then I pulled out my handle bender and uh, it kind of blew their mind and they let me do it. Um, a lot of things I would normally do, they wanted me to do it their way, which is fine because I was there to learn. But some things that I had um, techniques or something that was easier for my weaker hands, um, and I showed them that it, it worked as well, they, they would let me do it. Um, I think I've covered all that I can really share um, in all these days of training and, um, you know, one short lunch break and it was long, you know, long days. Um, and most of it's just practice. I mean, if I even if once I got something, and they're like, "Okay, that looks good," and then they would give me like eight or ten shears of that same thing to do. Um, I don't know if I'm a better teacher or worse teacher because I don't usually do that to you when you come in for training, unless you want to stay the extra days. So, um, other thing I want to talk about is. Um, the sharpeners that came to meet with us the day after my training and was able to take the tour through the Jaguar factory, and I'll show some pictures on here. Um, they came from um, uh, Portugal, Spain, UK, and Denmark. 
and all of them are members of the International Scissor Sharpers Association, which is an um, uh, organization that was started um, by a gentleman that came over from training, um, Ian, from Cyprus. And he said, I need to have more credentials before I go back. So we dreamed up, he and I, the International Scissor Sharpers Association. And then we had a sharpener in Las Vegas who was also a graphic artist. He designed some really cool looking graphics for a certificate and a card. So being a member of the International Scissor Sharpers Association is up till this year has basically been a you pay your money, you get a lifetime membership, um, and you can get a certificate and a card. And then I started um, last year, I guess or so, or maybe a couple of years ago. Um, where if they wanted to, to have their work critiqued and, um, and then I would just say um, certified and they would I would send them a couple of shears to sharpen um, I would damage it um, gave them a little written test um, and then when they came back I critique them and I would put them on video and if you look through my videos you'll see some of those I critique their work because um, that was important. I, th I think it was more uh, critiquing of their work than whether how, how they registered or how they compared to other sharpers. And then if they didn't quite get it right, I'd send them back. And some of them I sent them back three or four times. Uh, I think every one but one um, has eventually certified. And I, I imagine he will eventually. Uh, and um, so actually Jorgen, when we were there, the, the gentleman from Denmark, had had his shears I had sent to him previously and he brought them to me and we looked them over together and uh, so that he he um, certified and it's not very it's not very strict I'm basically looking to see do they cut is a convex edge a convex edge is a beveled edge a beveled edge did um, um, are the screws adjusted correctly you know I even those that pass I'll there'll be things I'll sh point out that well this could have been done better that could have been done better but um, I'm certifying them based on what I think a stylus would be happy with their work or not um, it's not it's not it's not anything compared to the other sharpening um, organizations that have the double blind you know very strict type of um, certification but it's it's a step to kind of for you to find out what you're doing but anyway back to the four guys uh, we got together and we had a little sharpening session we took some pictures with our sign we um, our hotel was right near the um, I can't say it in German but basically it's the German cutlery museum because Zoligan where we were is called the city of blades and I mean they're known for their knives and cutlery and shears and there would be statues and things all over the city of um, giant shears. There's a picture right here that was in the Jaguar factory. Of the, the, uh, and there's a couple other pictures I'll show you that are um, were decorated shears. They were kind of fun. And so we all, we, we did a little sharpening thing. We took some um, tours of some of the places, took some pictures and uh, the guys really enjoyed the, the trip to the factory and we said that we wanted to start trying to have something maybe on an annual or every semi-annual basis in Germany and we'd invite people from the states or anybody that um, was a member of the ISSA, International Scissor Sharpers Association, to, to come and, and give us a chance to have a little European trip. Um, so I don't know what what will be coming about but, but stay tuned, make sure that you're on my email newsletter list so I can let you know follow us on uh, Facebook and then I'll put something hopefully on YouTube. So if you have any questions about any of this um, you can email me, put comments down below. Um, as I said if you're not already subscribing please subscribe to my channel. I'm hoping to do, now that I've reached a thousand and I feel like y'all are really listening to me, <laughs> um, want to know what I have to say, um, I'm going to try to shoot a few more videos, and if y'all don't mind my desk being this messy and maybe um, my hair's not always that perfect, um, I'll be shooting more videos and updating you things I've learned, or and we can kind of do some um, experiments together. Also, if you have some shears that you get in for sharpening and they're just beyond what you want to do, um, please... Um, you know, send them to me. 
I'll sharpen them or try to fix them, uh, try to repair them. If I can't repair them, you'll see that too, why, you know, that this is one you should walk away from. And uh, I'm not saying I'm the best sharpener. Um, I, sometimes I feel like Cinderella, like somebody's going to discover. I really don't know what I'm doing. But I think that feeling inside that I have more to learn, that I haven't arrived, helps me learn more. And it also helps me to understand where you may be, where you feel like you need to know more. If you're able to sharpen, if you're able to keep your customers happy, that's the key. And then improve, improve, improve. Because I, regardless of what anybody says, I don't think anyone has arrived. Um, you, I see too much disagreements even amongst manufacturers from different countries on how things are done. Oh, before we leave, about the testing material, the cellophane. I did some tests, and I'll show you about a shear that passed the cellophane test and that didn't pass my typical wet tissue or the single ply cheap toilet paper test. So um, just a little FYI, I'm going to stick to toilet paper over cellophane. I think toilet paper has a lot of advantages over cellophane too. Maybe not if you're wrapping up things to put in the refrigerator, but in everyday use. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thank you for listening to my video.